I know you the stewards of this land. And so, on behalf of uh, the people of Micronesia, uh, I want to, to say thank you for allowing us to come and, and swim alongside you. Our canoe is uh, kind of leaking. As a, as a people of the liquid continent of our maker. So I came here to, to see how, how I can help along the current stewards. Walk and see if I can bail and help Pat while they say, I don't think we're in a posture of sailing now. But uh, let's patch up the holes and, and bail the water so our kids can sail. That's why I'm here. Thank you. In terms of Moana Nui, translate, it means, to me as a native woman from Rapa Nui, it means all of the ocean, all of the people, and that involve that this body of water touches all of us, regardless what. We no longer are divided by country, by colonizers, by I'm Hawaiian, you're, you're Tongan, you're this. If not, Moana Nui meaning we are all unity and what's more important to me now is to unify us as all to protect and support and um, speak and be heard and about our own issues as, as living human beings of the ocean and Pacific Ocean. Vanuatu has a wonderful case study where they are now um, they've gone so much further ahead in terms of trying to sustain their culture and influencing policy. It is now government policy in terms of uh, making customary land, which is then tied to custom practice, a central part of government and government policy making. So that's a story of hope that we that, that I think was quite important at Moana Nui is that for other Pacific Island countries we can learn very quickly from the story of loss, but also from the narrative from Vanuatu that's coming through, that you can bring about change. It can happen. Vanuatu is demonstrating that that's happening right now. I'm in the government. I'm in the cabinet of my country, but also uh, 
in the Melanesian Spearhead Group, which is the five countries of Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, Fiji, also from the wider South Pacific Island region, which is the politically independent states of the South Pacific, who are normally grouped in the Pacific Island Forum, what is called the Pacific Island Forum. Uh, and I just want to give an overview of some of the issues that uh, we are facing in our region from that perspective. The uh, politically independent states of the South Pacific, uh, the first, one, first country to gain independence from the colonial powers was, I think, Fiji in 1970. Papua New Guinea in 1975, and then it went on. Uh, Vanuatu became independent in 1980. What that meant was that the boundaries had been drawn up of the territories, and the indigenous people, who are the majority of the populations of the nations, inherited those boundaries, and inherited those states, and inherited those bureaucratic government structures, and inherited those systems of administration of the territories. So brown faces moved into where the white faces used to be. And we faced the same problems. Uh, it was political independence, but we were still within the uh, economic, economically colonized uh, sphere, and we still are. So the struggle has been to see how we can make this democracy work for us, which is something which is uh, in many ways quite foreign to our own concepts of governance, how we can use this political sovereignty in the United Nations world to advance the aims of Pacific peoples. And this has always been a challenge, especially because the state, as we know, is uh, agent for corporate globalization. So what's happening in the Pacific is that there are a, a, a wide range of experiences in, in the politically independent Pacific of how we're engaging with those particular struggles. Uh, Professor Noina Silver at the university found petitions, 38,000 signatures of our people in 1897 who signed it. I'd never been told in our family that our ancestors were against, were opposed to being annexed to the United States. It was really something, it, it, it was a gift to many of us to know that our ancestors did fight back. So these kinds of things I think have uh, the consciousness, you know, going back into our history, recounting what really happened to us I think has helped us and that is knowing what has uh, happened to us, that our people did not give their consent to be a part of the United States has been very, very important to, to us to realize. And thus, from this knowledge, there has been a movement to restore our nation. And there's all different kind of variations of that, all the way from nation within a nation to full-on restoration of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Uh, to um, just independence from the United States. But I think that that is something that is, uh, a lot of people don't understand it, and it's something that um, is very current in, in, uh, in Hawaii right now. Understanding that, you know, Hawaii, we as a people are, facing military expansion, we're gonna get more, not less of all of this stuff. Uh, understanding the Pacific p uh, pivot and the expansion, I think has made us realize, looking at the whole Pacific and all the activity that's been going on with military expansion, that we're not alone, that we have to see the big picture, and that we have to have, it's very important for us to have solidarity with other people who are also f facing the same conditions. And so um, solidarity is very important. I think that's what Moana Nui is all about, us getting together and talking about the conditions that we're facing and also sharing some of the successes of how to you know, confront what it is that we, we have to uh, confront. I want to take us to Bougainville. Now, some of you know about Bougainville. Bougainville 
is our biggest example. But our politicians don't want to learn about Bougainville. The local landowner, Sam Kauna, walked out of a meeting when the New Zealanders who were doing the study on behalf of Rio Tinto told Sam Kauna and his people, your river isn't polluted, it isn't poison, it's good river. Sam stormed out of that meeting and went straight to the bush. And for the next 10 years, Bougainvilleans were living in the bush and 16,000 of them lost their lives. It costed money for Rio Tinto, but a lot of blood for Papua New Guineans. Now they died at the hands of our own military, our PNG military. So these are lessons in the Ramonikul. Ramonikul is very close because I live in the town and it's just hours away from where I live. So we keep a keen eye on Ramonikul. And a lot of young people come to me and say, if this doesn't work for us, we are talking a Bougainville solution here. Now it is my wish that this doesn't happen in Medang again. As a nation who struggle for independence, politically independence, and also struggle to protect our land, this is something that uh, we are faced. So military use West Papua as a source of economy for income. Uh, we have mining. Uh, we have big U.S. mining company in West Papua, and, and they take uh, our gold, copper, and uranium to support the U.S. Um, military um, funding, and that funding they use to support Indonesian military back, you know, to to force the the, the Papuan, indigenous Papuan, uh, from um, speak out uh, about their independence. And I want to now talk about the island that I come from, Molokai. I think it's almost the same size as Rapa Nui. Um, with the same amount of people. And I was talking to the guy from Rapa Nui and there was lots of things going back and forth that we could understand what we're talking about. On, uh, in Hawaii, they call the island of Molokai the last Hawaiian island. And I'm not quite sure why they, they, they say that, but that's the name that we have today. And it's the only island besides uh, a private island called Ni'ihau where the the majority of the population is actually Hawaiians. And the reason why they call us the last Hawaiian island, I believe, is because we have been able to keep two economies on our island. One economy, the cash economy, which we all participate in, but the other most important economy for us is the subsistence economy. The ability to use our resources in the ocean and on the land to feed our families for free. We pay no taxes on it, and that's why the government don't even want us to use that word subsistence over there, and they don't like our economy. And that gives us a feeling of independence. The prayer asks for knowledge from our ancestors, and specifically it refers to the the ancient knowledge that was shared from person to person over thousands of years, orally, verbally, through, through songs. So it's a, a prayer about songs and stories. The second is a prayer that the late Kanalu Young and I composed together in 1993 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the loss of our kingdom to the United States. Uh, this prayer is called a prayer for sovereignty, pule no ke ea. And the word sovereignty, ea, actually means a kind of rightness, a spiritual rightness, a being at home in itself. It's a word that we began to use for political sovereignty in the 19th century when our sovereignty was threatened by other countries for the first time. Um, there is a line in that song, in this prayer, a maumana omai. It means, let the thought continue. And with 
this conference as a continu continuation of the last one. Um, we hope that this thought continues. E ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e O na me ahu na no e ahu O na me le E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e O na me ahu na no e ahu, o na me le e ho mai, e ho mai, e ho mai, e ho mai ka i ke mai luna mai e. O na me ahu na no e ahu, o na me le. Eh oh my, eh oh my, eh oh my. a U.S. colony. Um, I came from Wananui too because Wananui 1 was so exciting. Um, it was really exhilarating and honestly I'm not disappointed at all. Wananui was even more badass. I mean the people here are so wholly devoted to their separate but connected causes for peace and justice. They're informed and passionate and luminous and I, I'm honored to be a part of it. And can you talk just a little bit about your own work and all of this and how it's related to okay. what you've all talked about this weekend? Okay, <laughs> that's a tall order because <laughs> this conference actually was jam-packed with tons of information. Um, but I will say, I think there was certain, you know, strands and themes that were all sort of coalesced really clearly in the conference. I think there's a hyper-militarism of the Asia-Pacific region. As we know from Obama administration's Pacific pivot, um, the Pacific is where empire's chickens are coming home to roost. So the story of loss was really quite powerful for me, particularly from um, the delegates of Hawaii, because it really shows um, the depth of you know, what you give up in the story of loss. Um, and to get back to what you have, some of the rethinking that's going around, reclaiming processes that they have to go through now in terms of the Kingdom of Hawaii. And for us, it, it is a very good story that needs to be told, particularly in Melanesia, where we're trying to sustain, and Polynesia and Micronesia also, where we need to sustain our cultural practices. In Hawaii, we celebrate the fact that this year, we were able to get the legislature to repeal a two-year-old law, the Public Lands Development Corporation, a law that would have allowed, basically allowed a committee uh, to circumvent um, almost all of the state and county laws that have to do with land use. Uh, passed by the legislature, signed, actually not just signed by the governor, governor of the state wanted this badly. He accused those of us who opposed it with being hysterical, and hysterically we proceeded. Uh, a lot of people participated in the movement to get this repeal. Many different organizations, and they showed up with their signs. And you know what, what the really wonderful thing about the PLDC was? It's not that we won this victory because basically the state just turns around and figures out other ways to get what it wants. The state never runs out of opportunities to make things easier for development. What was good about the PLDC victory is that we brought a lot of people together. And because the victory showed people that you, you just basically have to do this work. You cannot simply 
We cannot abdicate to cynicism. We cannot abdicate to this notion that we are helpless, to this belief that, that states, that companies, multinational companies, that money and capital are more powerful than the voice of people. We cannot surrender that basic point. And so when we celebrate, when we celebrate our achievements together, um, that's as important as the commitment we made to be in the struggle to be in the first place. Te nei te whenua, te rū, nei te tangi nei mo aku haraka anui e, i e ke ki hea, i e ke ki hea, i e ke ki runga ki ai ano te tukunga i o ko rangi, ko papa, ko tāne mahuta i tokona i te rangi i rio ki runga rā, ko ia ko hene kino i hui ai te tangata ki te ao whakarere ki whakarere kōrero, ko ia ko Māui mua, ko Māui pai, ko Māui roto, ko Māui taha, Ko Māui tiki tiki ar tārangi here ai te rā i rio ki runga rā. Nā tāne i fiu ai tō tūpuna ki raro he ngā ti he wa Māuri ora. I just wanted to say, um, I'm grateful for everything that's been brought here. Our sister that talked about the basket and the knowledge that we, um, that we share as Indigenous people. Um, what, what we're going to take back to Aotearoa is what we came with. The saddest thing to hear, hear, hear was people talking about New Zealand supporting globalization, privatization. And, you know, it's, it's really hurtful for me. I like them to talk about rugby, the All Blacks. I feel proud. <laughs> <clears throat> but I just want to thank all of those that made it possible for us to be a victor. Thank you, brother. I'm here because of, uh, to support my, my brothers from the furthest part, the geographically removed from me, uh, ancestrally, from Rapa Nui. And our brothers that cover the whole of Moana Nui. The short time Paul asked me if I'd say what Moana Nui means to us, it's our language. Our sisters from Tonga, the south. Tonga Tapu, sacred south. And I just wanted to say that the moana to us is our mother. It's our mother. The, the water we call is the kiri wai wai o papa tuanuku. It's the skin of our mother. Our mother feeds us. Ana is a container. And that's what the sea is to us. It feeds us. Under the sea, under the water is our mother. And what I said was an ancient prayer that we teach our children now. And what we were saying there, we have, our people were prophets, not people who made a prophet. We were led to inhabit these isles, these paradises, for a reason. So that time would come, we'd be able to reorientate our other brothers and sisters about who we are and our relationship to Atua, to God. We don't have a problem with God. Those that came to us had a problem. So I just want to share our waka to us, which has carried us all here. The front of our waka, we call it different things. The bird man. Tangata manu. Sits at the front of our canoe, because that's our lineage from God to the firstborn. He sits at the front of our canoe, and he bridges us to all the other islands of the Pacific. So we know our lineage back to the firstborn. Honua is what we call the deep ocean. Honua goes back to our, our genealogies you'll find throughout the Pacific, to our first parents, Kumu Kumu Honua and Lalo Honua, to, to ancestors that are two, a man and a woman. The sky, the heavens, Rangi, is the physical manifestation of our Heavenly Father. Our earth is our mother, a physical manifestation of our mother. So we know who we are. So we want you all to know what Moana Nui means to us. Kia ora tātou.